How does one actually apply a neck restraint? We teach a couple of different techniques, but the basic idea is you use your elbow as a landmark and you place your arm across. So your bicep would be on one side of the neck and your arm would be on the forearm of the other side of the neck. And then there's a couple of different hand placements, but then you apply pressure with head pressure on both sides of the neck uh, to gain compliance. And you, you were demonstrating you were using a, you were using your arm to do that. Is That's that, correct. And it also be done with a leg. It can be done with a leg. Does MPD train on how to do it with a leg? We may show um, the younger officers in the academy what that looks like, but we don't train uh, leg neck restraints with the officers in service. We, and as far as my knowledge, we never have. How, how would a trained neck restraint work? Uh, I'm sorry, how would a trained uh, leg neck restraint work? People that watch MMA, so professional fighters, they call it a uh, triangle choke, and I use that term choke loosely, that's just what it's called. But that's when you place your, uh, your leg over somebody's back, cross their side of their neck, and then you trap their arm in, so the person ends up having one arm in, and their arm causes pressure on one side, and the leg causes pressure on the second, and you can actually uh, render somebody unconscious if you hold that long enough. The, uh, uh, what part of the leg? Uh, usually it's the inner thigh. Inner thigh. So in, in this scenario, using a leg to do a neck restraint, would the, would the knee sort of replace the elbow in terms of placement? Or how would you describe it? Um, I, would, I would say the knee doesn't really replace the elbow. Um, your thigh would be across the side of somebody's neck, your leg across their back, um, and you protect the airway really with the space that's created with their arm being pinned in there. If you could uh, uh, please display the next page, page 53. Um, use of neck restraints. Uh, can you describe, in using this, those concepts of proportionality, when it's authorized uh, to use a neck restraint of the two different varieties? Yes, sir. On, on subjects who are actively aggressive, which means assaultive, they're actively resisting and other techniques haven't worked, you can use it then. Um, and then on the bottom it says no, that you, you can't use it against subjects who are passively resistant. And if you could go to the next slide, uh, page 54. And, and after a neck restraint is applied, there are certain guidelines that you train that have to be followed. Is that right? That's correct. For the care of the individual upon whom the neck restraint was applied. Yes, sir. And if we could uh, publish uh, exhibit 110 again, and bringing this specific topic back to the concept of proportionality, could you enlarge this please? Uh, do you have one of those uh, stylus up there? Yeah, oh, I guess I do. You can, uh, you can touch the screen and make a mark here. Uh, Unconscious neck restraint. An unconscious neck restraint is when the person would actually be rendered unconscious, correct? That's correct. And intentionally so. Yes, sir. Could you please underline uh, unconscious neck restraint as you see it in this uh, response and control guide? Yes, sir. And what subject uh, activity, what level of subject activity would be required to use an unconscious neck restraint? Well, according to this chart, it's in the red area, so it would be active aggression. Okay. And do you agree with that? Yeah. I, I, I think in the, the last slide we talked about active resistance if other techniques didn't work, but definitely in um, active aggression is where it's placed. If we look then, uh, you can also find a conscious neck restraint, and that's the neck restraint that's used for the purpose of control, correct? Correct. Could you underline uh, where that is in this uh, force continuum, Exhibit 110? And uh, so the conscious neck restraint is authorized in circumstances where there's, in fact, active resistance. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So then if there was uh, something like passive resistance, right, the conscious, neither the conscious neck restraint nor the unconscious neck restraint would be authorized. Is that right? Would not be authorized? Would not be authorized. That is correct. And uh, an unconscious neck restraint would not even be authorized for some forms of active resistance, would it? Uh, that's correct. And uh, if the subject is offering no resistance, obviously, then 
no neck restraint would be authorized. That's correct. Or any restraint. Would it? Or any. Or, or any restraint. If there's no. Yeah, generally, no. Okay. <clears throat> In addition to the um, uh, classroom training, uh, you actually teach officers, show them physically how to do these sort of neck restraints? Yes, sir. Uh, at this time, I'd like to republish Exhibit 17. Sir, is this an MPD trained neck restraint? No, sir. Has it ever been? Not to my neck restraint? No, sir. <clears throat> Is this an MPD authorized uh, restraint technique? Uh, knee on the neck would be something that uh, does happen in use of force that isn't unauthorized. And under what circumstances would that be authorized? How long can you do that? I don't know if there's a time frame. It would depend on the circumstance of the time. Okay. Which would include what? <clears throat> the type of resistance you're getting from the subject that you're putting the knee on. Right. And so if there was, uh, say for example, uh, the subject was under control, and handcuffed, would this be authorized? I would say no. 